Hi, good morning everyone and welcome to our first session of the day three of Southeast Asian Breast Cancer Symposium. Again, I'm Dr. Remy Caris Velasco and I'll be your moderator for this session and I feel very privileged. So as you all know, uh, breast cancer management has evolved into multidisciplinary, evidence-based uh, surgical specialty. From the era of Halted's radical, ma radical mastectomy up to the modified radical mastectomy. And when a lot of scientists, dedicated ones such as Professor Veronese, developed the skill of doing quadratectomy, it took about 30 years to do that. And uh, surgeons love to challenge themselves. So they usually would uh, do or develop new skill. And this led to complex oncologic uh, techniques and even reconstructive uh, procedures. And a lot of, or a number of landmark trials have established already that lumpectomy can be a standard uh, care for many patients, especially for early disease. So for this session, we will learn about new and emerging data on surgical management from none other than one of our esteemed speakers, Dr. Anis Chogpar. She's a full professor in the Department of Surgery at Yale School of Medicine. She also completed the Susan G. Common Interdisciplinary Breast Fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And she also built the first nationally accredited breast cancer in Kentucky at the James Graham Brown Cancer Center and was recruited to Yale where she led its effort to become the first NCI designated comprehensive cancer center in the Northeast to have a nationally accredited breast cancer. So live from the USA, let us all welcome Dr. Anis Chagpar. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here, and uh, I wish I could have been there in person, but this is the next best thing. Uh, so thank you again for having me. I will share my screen. So when I was asked to give this talk on um, an update in breast cancer surgery, I spoke with the organizers and I said, you know, that's such a large topic. And they said, well, we really want you to focus on, on reconstructive surgery. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, a few of my disclosures, uh, as you can see on the screen here, um, but none of these will be uh, pertinent to what I'm discussing today. But I do have some other disclaimers. The first is that I am not a breast reconstructive surgeon. I'm a breast surgical oncologist. So, um, so uh, you should know that I am not a plastic surgeon, uh, even though I will be discussing a lot of the literature um, on reconstructive techniques. The second is, even though we narrowed the topic to an update in breast reconstructive surgery, it is absolutely impossible to cover all of the updates in breast cancer reconstructive surgery in 10 to 15 minutes, which is the time that I have allotted to my talk today. So what I've decided to do is really focus on a few, what I will call hot topics, um, topics that uh, you may be thinking about, you may have questions about, and certainly are things that we discuss in our tumor boards and, and at our meetings. I will cite current literature, most of it within the past year, because after all, this is supposed to be an update. Um, so we'll really be focusing on recent literature and I'll be presenting to you many meta-analyses of clinical trials that have gone before that have answered some of these questions. Now, as we've already heard, um, breast cancer management has evolved and we now know that breast conserving surgery and simple mastectomy are equivalent in terms of their survival. Each of these may have merits and demerits and may be particularly well suited to some conditions versus others. So for example, 
Breast conserving surgery is particularly good for people with small tumors uh, that are unifocal. And we need to remember that breast conserving surgery must be followed by radiation therapy. Total mastectomy, um, however, is better for patients who have larger tumors, uh, ones that may be multifocal or multicentric, tumors that may have nipple involvement, uh, because we know that if you remove uh, that area in a breast conserving approach, you will leave the patient with a cosmetic defect. Simple mastectomy is also a choice of many patients who have genetic risk, who may be opting for mastectomy for risk reduction. And these patients don't uniformly need post-mastectomy radiation. The decision for radiation therapy really depends on, on their, their tumor size and their lymph node status. But we also know that we haven't limited ourselves simply to these two options of breast conserving surgery and mastectomy. We now have looked at ways that we can improve the cosmetic outcome after each of these surgeries. So after breast conserving surgery, we can certainly use oncoplastic techniques that um, often will use local tissue rearrangement. And after mastectomy, we know that reconstruction is an option, whether that is done in the immediate setting or delayed or a combination of the two. We know that it can either use tissue expanders and implants or a patient's own tissue. So autologous reconstruction, and that can be from a number of donor sites. Now, with all of these issues and these options, there are a number of uh, topics to discuss. So first, when we think about oncoplastics and breast conserving surgery, we know that there are many techniques dependent on where in the breast the, the tumor is. We can see that there are a variety of techniques that we can use. This was a, a recent uh, meta-analysis that was published in Surgical Oncology just this year, where Yasin and colleagues looked at the differences between oncoplastics versus conventional breast conserving surgery. You can see here um, when they looked at odds ratios for both oncologic outcomes and complications, by and large, these two techniques are very similar. So it really doesn't matter whether you use oncoplastics or conventional techniques, um, they are very similar in terms of their positive margin rate, the rate at which you need to do a completion mastectomy, rates of infection, seroma, hematoma, and skin necrosis. Oncoplastic techniques do tend to be a little bit better in terms of re-excision rates and local regional re um, relapse. And this may be because when we tend to do an oncoplastic resection, we in general are taking more tissue. And as we take more tissue, um, we can perhaps lower uh, the re-excision rates and have a, a better outcome in terms of local regional recurrence. What about after mastectomy? Um, many of us have questions and, and concerns about the type of reconstruction, the timing of reconstruction. And so let, let's dive a little bit into uh, reconstruction after mastectomy. Now, I think we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is the whole aspect of radiation. Because radiation therapy will affect the timing of the reconstruction, whether we do this in a delayed fashion or an immediate fashion or in a delayed immediate fashion, um, as Steve Kronowitz uh, has termed it. Because we know that radiation therapy will affect um, our reconstruction, whether we use implants, and it can certainly increase the rates of infection and capsular contracture, even increase extrusion of the implant. It can also affect our reconstruction if we use autologous tissue by increasing flap shrinkage and thrombosis. This was a, a meta-analysis that was published by Awadine um, and colleagues in uh, aesthetics and plastic uh, surgery uh, that was published just earlier this year. Here you can see comparing 
um, uh, uh, implants, uh, radiation uh, versus no radiation. In patients with prepectoral implants, you can see that there's a higher rate of infection, nearly two and a half fold, a higher rate of capsular contracture, nearly five fold, and a higher rate of implant loss, nearly three fold. So we know that radiation and reconstruction by and large do not mix, but sometimes you don't have a choice in terms of the radiation therapy that a patient will need because that's part of their oncologic treatment. So uh, here, uh, Gal et al, uh, in a paper that they published in the International Journal of Surgery earlier this year, looked at whether it was better to radiate um, after a tissue expander, so before putting in the permanent implant, put in the tissue expander, as you're expanding these patients, give radiation so that their radiation is completed, then remove the tissue expander and replace it with a permanent implant, or whether it is better to radiate after the permanent implant. And you can see that there are advantages and disadvantages to each technique. So here, when they looked at reconstructive failure, that was higher after radiating after the permanent implant. However, when they looked at capsular contracture, that was higher if you radiated after the tissue expander before the permanent implant. So no matter how you slice it, there are advantages and disadvantages to uh, both timings. Another question that uh, tends to come up, especially recently, is where to place the implant. Historically, many people have used a subpectoral breast reconstructive approach where the implant is placed below the pectoral muscle. You may use a, an acellular dermal matrix uh, to cover the remaining implant, but you're really using the muscle uh, to cover uh, at least the superior pole of the implant. More recently, many plastic surgeons have moved to prepectoral breast reconstruction, putting the implant on top of the muscle and then covering the entire implant with an acellular dermal matrix. The idea here is that potentially, if you put the implant above the muscle, you may have less pain due to um, the, the muscle pulling. So in this meta-analysis um, that was published in Cancers earlier this year, you can find that that is in fact the case, that prepectoral uh, implants are associated uh, with less post-operative pain. This does slightly cross one. However, um, by and large, that is uh, a true statement that prepectoral uh, implants tend to be associated with less pain. However, subpectoral implants are associated with a significantly lower rate of seroma. Um, and so, uh, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both. It's really a trade-off between post-operative pain and seroma in choosing between prepectoral and subpectoral location for the implant. You can see here in the rest of this meta-analysis that implant loss, skin necrosis, wound infection, and hematoma uh, were essentially equivalent between the two techniques with all of these odd ratios uh, crossing one in terms of the 95% confidence interval. In addition, several people have talked about moving to using more and more direct to implant based reconstruction. So avoiding the tissue expander altogether. And so here again, you can see that when you look at all of these complications as Silva and, and colleagues did um, in their meta analysis that was published earlier this year, um, all of these are essentially equivalent. There were only two uh, complications that were significantly different when you compare uh, going direct to implant versus um, doing a submuscular approach with a tissue expander implant-based reconstruction, and that is in terms of rippling and animation deformity. Not surprisingly, if you have the implant above the muscle, uh, you will see more rippling. 
However, if you put the implant below the muscle, you will see more animation deformity simply because you're now seeing uh, the effect of that muscle on top of the implant. So when the muscle contracts, you're going to see that animation deformity. What about autologous reconstruction? So far, we've talked about implant-based reconstruction in terms of uh, its timing and position and so on and so forth. But many people will opt for autologous reconstruction. And here you can see a number of the areas where we can uh, have autologous reconstruction. So one of the classics was using an LD flap from the back. Certainly tram flaps have had their day in the sun and have now moved on to um, more sophisticated techniques using abdominal tissue, such as the deep flaps, the SIEA flaps, free trams, pedicle tram, trams. We now know that microvascular anastomoses have allowed us to look at other sites where we can get donor tissue, so the gluteal flaps, the S gaps, and the I gaps, as well as tugs or TMG uh, flaps using tissue from the thighs. If we look at the various abdominal flap uh, options, because these do tend to be the most commonly used, again, they vary in terms of complication rates. So here, if you look at these data that I'm, I'm showing from Mortada et al. and their meta-analysis that was published in the Breast Journal earlier this year, using deep flaps as a reference, you can see that, for example, free tram flaps and pedicle tram flaps may have a higher rate of hernia. However, they have a lower rate of total uh, uh, flap loss. Um, they vary in terms of partial flap loss and wound infections and so on and so forth. So you can see that for all of these various flaps, there are some advantages, there are some disadvantages, and really we've become accustomed now to thinking about individualizing uh, the option for reconstruction given our patient's body habitus, their other comorbidities, what might be their concerns, in addition to um, our facility um, and our experience with various techniques. So for example, if you have somebody who is diabetic and you want to avoid wound infections, you may not uh, choose to do an SIEA flap, which has a very high rate of wound infection um, and so on. One of the other questions that often comes up is, does BMI matter in terms of deep flap reconstruction? We often want somebody who has a higher BMI simply because we need the added tissue, particularly in bilateral reconstruction. On the other hand, we don't want somebody with too high of a BMI because we have the belief that that's going to increase our complication rate with obesity and, and, and so on. So this was um, a nice uh, meta-analysis that was done by Tan and colleagues published in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery earlier this year. You can see here that when they looked at total flap loss, partial flap loss, fat necrosis, infections, abdominal wound healing complications, and seromas, when they compared what they called slim patients and not slim patients, all of these were essentially equivalent. And when they looked at the total complication rates, although uh, the, uh, the big uh, black diamond of the forest plot is slightly below one favoring the slim patients, you can see that that does cross one. So there's no significant difference uh, in terms of total complication rates between the slim and the not slim patients. So, in summary, um, we have many options. Historically, we would tell our patients that there were really only two options. You can have breast conservation or you can have mastectomy. These days, we know that the options have become really much more of a plethora. Um, so under breast conservation, you can have oncoplastics or not. You can have conventional mastectomies or you can have skin sparing or nipple sparing mastectomies with immediate reconstruction. After a conventional mastectomy, you can opt to stay flat or you can have delayed reconstruction. 
If you have immediate reconstruction, you can have this either be autologous through a number of uh, donor sites, or you can have it uh, be an implant. If you choose an implant, it can be prepectoral or subpectoral. And many of these are equivalent, as I've shown you, in terms of uh, their complications and so on. So when faced with all of these options, while our patients may be somewhat confused, the good news is that we now have many tools in our toolbox to help our patients uh, in terms of their reconstructive approach. So with that, I'd like to close and thank you all for your attention. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I believe we're doing that at the end of the session. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. Chagpar, for that very wonderful lecture. Uh, clearly, our patients now are choosing between all the options that you just presented. And thank you for uh, giving us all the related researchers that have studied all the advantages and disadvantage disadvantages of each technique. So from the USA, we go now from our, for, from um, USA, we go now to our second speaker. Um, Doc, Dato Dr. Cheng Har Yip. Uh, Dr. Yip is currently a consultant breast surgeon in Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare in Malaysia and is the lead clinician for Breast Cancer Research Program in Cancer Research Malaysia. She was also conferred Professor Emeritus by the University of, of Malaya in October 2016. She has over 250 publications in peer reviewed journals mainly on breast cancer in the Asian setting. So without further ado, let us all work, welcome Dr. Yip, who is joining us live here at SEDA. Okay, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to give this uh, lecture. Um, can I have my slides? I'll be talking about new and emerging data on surgical management. We've already heard Dr. Chakpa talk about reconstruction, and my job is actually to talk about the rest. Okay, now, almost every woman with breast cancer, I think I have to go this. Okay, almost every woman with breast cancer will require surgery, whether upfront or after neoadjuvant systemic therapy. Over the past century, surgery for breast cancer has evolved from being maximal to being as minimal as possible. And there are a few reasons for non-surgical treatment. We have patients where we will not operate on, and these are patients who are not fit for surgery. They may be very old, like uh, with a lot of cardiac problems. They're not operable because they came with very advanced cancers, or they have metastatic breast cancer where surgery is only palliative. Now, we talk about de-escalating surgical management of breast cancer. De-escalating means doing less, less surgery. Now, surgery started with a radical mastectomy over 100 years ago, which was described by Dr. William Halstead. In this surgery, you take away the whole breast, the muscles, and all the axillary lymph nodes. So this left the woman with a very deformed chest wall, sunken in, and uh, a high risk of uh, lymphedema. So, Bernard Fisher well, is known for overturning the prevailing paradigm at that time that breast cancer spread from the breast in an orderly fashion to the lymph nodes and then to the rest of the body. He proposed that breast cancer is a systemic disease that metastasizes unpredictably. So, even in very early breast cancer, even if it's 1 cm, it could have already spread through the bloodstream. And in cases like that, surgery, whether you do a big surgery or small surgery, is not going to really improve survival. So, when I was training, we did the modified radical mastectomy, no longer the radical mastectomy, which, which I have never seen before. In the modified radical, we left the two muscles alone, so the chest wall is flat. In William Halstead's surgery, the, flat, the chest wall is deformed, is sunken in because they took out the two muscles. 
So from this, we went on to the breast conserving surgery, which started in the 1970s, and there were a lot of clinical trials done then. This is removal of the lump with a clear margin. Please note, the margins must be clear. Removal of lymph nodes for staging, but radiotherapy is essential. Even with radiotherapy, there's a 10% local recurrence rate. Without radiotherapy, the local recurrence rate is 40%. So good cosmetic outcome is possible, especially now with do what Dr. Chapa says is even you do a big lumpectomy which may cause deformity, you can do oncoplastic techniques to actually reduce the deformity and to maintain a good cosmetic outcome. This one, the studies have shown that actually it uh, has better quality of life, preserves self-image and a positive impact on sexuality. These are all the trials that were done on breast conserving surgeon after uh, and versus mastectomy. And all these studies have shown that breast conserving surgery is as good as mastectomy when it comes to overall survival. So this is level one evidence that breast conserving surgery gives you the same survival as mastectomy. However, you must choose your patients well. If you come with a large tumour, there's no way we can conserve your breast. But we can give chemotherapy first and still try to do a lumpectomy. In Malaysia, in my practice, about 40% of patients only are suitable for breast conservation. The rest actually need a mastectomy because they come late. So one of the key messages we give the public is that if you come early, we don't need to remove your whole breast. Now, the margin status. Like I say, clear margins are important, but how clear is clear? used to be that the guidelines said that you must have at least 5 millimeter. that was a 3 millimeter margin. So if you do a lumpectomy and the pathologists say margins are 2 millimeter, then you have to go back and cut some more and women usually don't like that when you tell them that I've got to go and cut some more. Usually we try to do everything one shot. Now, but now there's an end to controversy about how wide the margins are. So the SSO Astro guidelines now, endorsed by ESCO, says that no ink on tumour, either invasive or in situ component, is sufficient to say that margins are negative and you don't need to cut anymore. An appropriate adoption of these guidelines will decrease inappropriate re-excision rates for patients. Okay, so, but you find that a lot of oncologists and surgeons will still say they want two, three millimeter margins based on old guidelines. But the new guidelines say no ink on tumor is good enough. So, now we talk about less treatment is more for early stage breast cancer. And there was this big study done using the Netherlands Cancer Registry on 37,000 over women. But note, early stage breast cancer, early stage means not those with the bigger tumours, okay? Early stage breast cancer. Actually, after adjusting for confounding factors, they found that those who had breast conserving surgery were 21% more likely to be alive after 20 years than those who received mastectomy. This one is after you adjust for all confounding factors like the size, the lymph nodes, the grade, uh, no, the ER, PR, everything, you know? So this actually shows that BCT, breast conserving surgery, may be better than mastectomy. Um, <clears throat> so that's the, this study suggested that breast conserving surgery should be the treatment of choice in small T1 and 0 tumours. Now, in our practice, we actually do not see the T1 and 0 very often. These are tumours which are 2 cm or less and no negative. So for these sort of tumours, breast conserving surgery may be better than lumpectomy. So, <clears throat> and this study also shows that breast conserving surgery has less complications and costs less than mastectomy. Okay? So um, overall, these studies show that BCS is better than mastectomy in terms of survival, and in terms of complications, and in terms of costs, okay? But the problem is you must choose your patients well, and it's all about choosing your patients well. Okay, now, some studies have shown an increased risk of local recurrence and survival in younger women with breast conserving surgery, because if you have an old woman and a young woman, uh, who is likely to do better with breast conserving. This stu stu uh, study in uh, Denmark showed that 
younger women, less than 45 years, had a higher risk of local recurrence, that means the recurrence in the breast itself, and uh, breast cancer, higher breast cancer mortality compared to women more than 45 years old. Now, closer to home, this study in Singapore, retrospective study, also showed that women who were less than 40 years old were more likely to have increased disease, relapse and cancer death. So, what these two studies suggest is, for younger women, should we be doing breast conserving surgery? Because retrospective data shows that there might be more, uh, the outcome may not be as good as older women. Now, in Malaysia, we also did another study, and this is a big study because we look at women from uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. This is done by my friend Nirmala, who was here yesterday. Um, one of her PhD students did this, where we actually work a lot with Singapore and Hong Kong. We combine our databases to make one big database because to find young women, um, it's not that common, you know, especially if talking. This is less than 50 years old. And of this, you can see that 63.5% had mastectomy. Okay, so this is about the breast conserving rate we see. Um, the five-year survival in the breast conserving surgery and mastectomy was the same. This was in women less than 50. So basically, this study shows that whether you were old or young, BCS was as good as mastectomy. Okay, now, despite the fact that less is more, all the studies show that it's the same, mastectomy rates were going up in USA. Why is that so? Not only mastectomy rates were going up, bilateral mastectomy rates were going up. That means a woman had wanted mastectomy on one side and they wanted mastectomy on the other side. This is actually fear, isn't it? I have a lot of breast cancer patients who say they want both breasts out. Now, we have done a study on contralateral breast cancer. If you have no family history, no BRCA, the, the chance of you having breast cancer on your opposite breast is only 5%. 95%, you're not going to get a breast cancer on your opposite side. So why do you want to remove it? Um, but again, it is fear that is asking for this. So you have to give patients time. You can give them all the data, give them time to decide not to take out the other breast. And because you take out the other breast, then they say we might as well take out the, the uh, affected breast as well. So they want bilateral mastect and immediate reconstruction. Okay, now, so women want symmetry. If you do a mastectomy on one side, they do not like the asymmetry unless you do breast reconstruction. Even breast reconstruction, sometimes it's difficult to get, as, to get symmetry. If you do lumpectomy, if you do a big lumpectomy, you also do not get symmetry. And women want symmetry. Ranjit always tells me that, isn't it? Women want symmetry, <laughs> you know? So we always try to get symmetry. <laughs> okay, so that is for the breast. Now, and in fact, the surgical, the breast surgery societies in US actually advise against doing contralateral prophylactic mastectomy unnecessarily when there is no BRCA mutation because it does not um, improve survival. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm talking, going to talk about the escalation for lymph nodes as well. Just now, I talk about the escalating surgery for breast. Long ago, we did axillary dissection. These are the axillary lymph nodes. There are three levels. If you take out all three levels, the chance of lymphedema in our setup is 8%. But that 8% when you get lymphedema can be quite distressing. And except for surgery, all your scans, even your PET CT scan, does not tell you whether your lymph nodes are involved. You still need to take some tissue out to see. Now, complications of axillary dissection, seroma, pain, paresthesia, numbness of the distribution of the intercostal breaker nerve, frozen shoulder, lymphedema. Lymphedema is the most uh, dreaded complications that women all talk about, but it's not common, you know. Even when you do a full dissection, it's only 8% chance of uh, clinical lymphedema. Okay, so from axillary dissection, which could be level 2 to 3, that means take out all. When I was young, you had to take out at least 20 nodes or we would, did not do a full dissection, you know. The oncologists, when they see like 10 nodes, they say not good enough. 
And actually, our guidelines say for a dissection, 10 lymph nodes are enough, you know? Because some women just have less nodes than others. Women always ask, how many nodes do I have? I would say that there's no, it's not like you have 10 fingers and toes, you know? You don't know, it can range from 5 to 20. <coughs> so, from axillary dissection, we move to sentinel lymph node biopsy, where we take out only 1 to 3 lymph nodes. This uses the blue, uh, a blue dye or a radioactive uh, dye to identify the sentinel node, which is the first node to drain the breast. If the first node to drain the breast is negative, then you assume the rest of the lymph nodes are negative. But it need not be true. There's a 10% false negative rate. I always tell this uh, risk to the patients, you know. Some of them actually say, I want to be sure. I want you to take out all my nodes. So it depends on the patient. So, now, the problem with breast conserving surgery is that you need radiation. So, you must have access to radiation. In Malaysia, the access to radiation that was, checked, that was uh, um, <laughs> reported by IAEA that actually looks at radiation uh, access all over the world, they put us as about 75%. Uh, so, 25% of the population do not have access to radiotherapy. So, if the patient lives like four hours drive from a radiotherapy centre, they might want a mastectomy, you know? Uh, so, the... Now, yesterday, there was a session on de-escalating radiotherapy for breast cancer. I'm just going to roughly talk about it again in case you did not hear that lecture. Because radiotherapy now has also de-escalated. And um, we find that because of the excess, it's estimated that 20% of women who had BCS never actually received radiotherapy. And I've had patients like that. Before surgery, I tell them, you must have radiotherapy if I do lumpectomy. They say, yes, yes, yes. And when the report is back, they say, no, 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 I didn't agree to it. So it's a lot of actually um, uh, counselling for patients. Okay, so what do we mean by de-escalating radiotherapy? Initially, after lumpectomy, women needed 30 sessions or more. They had to have radiotherapy like six weeks. After that, there was this trial, the START-B trial, which shows that 15 fractions is good enough, so you can get your radiotherapy done in three weeks, plus about five um, boosts to the scar, then you have about four weeks radiotherapy. And now, even so, the fast-forward multicentric trial found that 20 grays in five fractions over one week is enough. So, radiotherapy duration has de-escalated from 30 times to about five times. Okay? And, and because it was shown that 90% of local recurrence occur in the quadrant where the primary tumour was, so now they even talk about accelerated partial breast irradiation. That means... You don't irradiate the whole breast, you just irradiate the area around where the tumour was. So, this APBI, or Accelerated Partial Breast Irradiation, was studied as an alternative to whole breast irradiation to make it a more palatable option for women. <clears throat> so, you just irradiate the area where the tumour was, the tumour bed. And there's many ways of doing it. You can get interstitial brachytherapy, balloon-based applicators, external beam radiotherapy, or intraoperative radiotherapy. IORT sounds more attractive option because it's just one shot. The others still need about five days. So from the patient perspective, APBI has led to increased access to radiation treatment, less travel, and reduced out-of-pocket costs, increased patient satisfaction, decreased radiation therapy exposures, and potentially improved cosmetic outcomes. So, APBI versus whole breast irradiation has been shown in clinical trials to be similar to the whole uh, breast irradiation. That means there's no difference in local recurrence or survival. So, there were two big trials on intraoperative radiotherapy. This was using the Morbitron, which is the Elliott trial, and this is using the intra-beam system, which is the target A trial, and both these trials actually showed that uh, the local recurrence rate and the survival was similar. Now, this is the intraoperative radiotherapy, which we have available, even in Philippines is available, but probably in the private hospitals only because uh, even in Malaysia, we have seven IORT units. Six of them are in the private sector. So basically, you take out the lump, put this radiotherapy in half an hour, take it out, close the skin. Okay, so sounds very 
good, but only certain patients are suitable, the very early good risk patients. So the target A trial shows that one-stop radiotherapy could offer an alternative to lengthy and inconvenient post-surgery procedures for breast cancer. Oops. All right, these are the guidelines for APBI with from three breast surgery uh, societies, American Breast Surgeon, Breast Surgery Astro and Association of Breast Surgeons. American Society of Breast Surgeons, I think these are all. So they have actually got criteria. So you must remember, it's elderly women above 50, all invasive types, tumor size less than 3 cm. So T1 or T2, the tumors, the margins, no tumor on ink, that's enough. So your margins must be clear. No negative, that means uh, these are the very early stage. Okay, and uh, that's it. I think I have to stop soon. What about the future? What about no surgery? Just leave it alone. There is actually, uh, these are all experimental cryotherapy, radiofrequency ablation, and microwave ablation. These are all uh, non invasive techniques, but there's absolutely no evidence. Women, there was some uh, WhatsApp or what YouTube going around about cryotherapy, and every woman came asking whether they could have it. It's not suitable, and there's no evidence. What about no surgery at all for the axilla? Now, the choosing YC recommendation, which is um, from USA and Canada, under the SS uh, Surgical uh, Society, uh, Society of Surgical Oncology, recommend no sentinel lymph node biopsy for women more than 70 years old, ER positive, HER2 negative, clinical node negative breast cancer. That means if you are old, you have a good type of breast cancer, you don't need to touch the axilla. So far, uh, most women actually want to know. So, Sentinel lymph node is fairly uh, innocuous. Okay. So, this is a paradigm shift in surgical treatment of breast cancer from maximum to breast conserving to minimal surgery. So, less is more, which means that it's the same. And, or maybe it is more, not the same. And then the radiation treatment from maximum radiation to less radiation to even less radiation. So again, less is more from the radiotherapy. And then what about the future? We've moved from mastectomy to breast conservation, to sentinel lymph node, to oncoplastic. So basically, it's preservation of breast first, then preservation of axilla, and finally, preservation of body image. So in conclusion, less is more only if more is too much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yip, for that very comprehensive uh, lecture. Uh, I noticed that you've touched on both um, de-escalating surgical approach, not just on the breast, but also on the axilla, because we um, deal with this in terms of um, staging our patients and treating our patients as well. And we even have a bonus uh, about uh, de-escalation of even uh, radiation therapy. Uh, so. Uh, I think we can entertain questions from our online audience and our audience here uh, live at uh, SEDA. Uh, my first question for our two speakers is, I think um, patients with breast cancer are very uh, worried about um, cancer coming back. And uh, for surgical oncologists, this is the uh, biggest threat uh, to us when we encounter a new growth or uh, even a local recurrence or regional recurrence. So can you uh, comment on um, doing a more conservative approach both in the axilla and at the same time assuring our patients that um, we are not um, dealing with a high recurrence rate? Dr. Chagbar. Yeah, I yeah, I, I can I can certainly start with that. Um, so the good news is that everything that we do is based on data and on clinical trials. And so we know uh, all the way back from NSABP B04, um, with you know more than 25 years worth of data, that removing lymph nodes does not increase survival. And so really, it, it comes down to local recurrence. 
And so as we moved from axillary node dissection to sentinel node biopsy to now, you know, not even removing all of the lymph nodes, even when a sentinel node is positive, all of that is based on data. So if you look, for example, at the ACASOG Z11 trial, we know that uh, if you compare those patients who had an axillary node dissection after a positive sentinel node, they had uh, the same local recurrence rate, roughly, uh, and it was a low local recurrence rate, um, so less than 1% uh, at about a median of five or six years, compared to those who did not have a completion of axillary node dissection. So the fact that these two are equivalent, even though in the axillary node dissection group, 27.3% of patients still had disease in the axilla, tells us that the risk of local recurrence when you're doing less is not significantly different than if you were doing more. And so there is a trade-off to be had between you know, the complications, the sequelae, the side effects of doing more, and the fact that really there is no added benefit. When Dr. Yip was talking about, you know, doing less surgery, even outside of the axilla, we now know that there are clinical trials ongoing, certainly here in the U.S. with Henry Cure's exceptional responder trial, looking at triple negative uh, patients, as well as those who are HER2 positive, he's now expanded this to include luminal patients as well. It may be that with advances in systemic therapy, as well as in radiation therapy, that actually taking out more is just that. It's just taking out more. It doesn't necessarily mean doing better. It may just be doing more. And it, it harkens back to you know, the olden days when we started with radical mastectomies, and we thought that that was the right thing to do. But as we get more clinical trial data, and as we become more knowledgeable based on hard evidence, right, it's not postulation, it, it's actual data. When we discover that, you know, doing more isn't necessarily leading to better outcomes, I think that's the reassurance that we can give patients. Thank you, Dr. Chagbar. Um, may we hear from uh, Dr. Yip? Well, <clears throat> I think all the data, all the evidence, and this is level one ed evidence, has shown that doing less is more, that if whether you do a big operation, cause a lot of deformity, or you do a minimal operation, you will still have the same, uh, uh, same outcome. The main factor actually is choosing your patients well. Those where you can do less are the early stage breast cancers. Of course, I mean, yesterday I gave a talk on all the advanced breast cancers. Those need surgery, but mastectomy, you know? So when we talk about less is more, it's only a select group of patients who actually present with stage one or early stage two breast cancer. You know? So to add on to what Dr. Chapa says, you have to choose your patients to do less. Uh, of course, I agree to, with, with both of you, and um, all, almost all of the studies that were done um, comparing breast conserving surgery to mastectomy also didn't show any significant uh, difference in disease-free survival and overall, overall survival. Um, I think for our next question, uh, may we ask um, Dr. Chag Park, since you, since you talk about uh, reconstructive surgery, um, putting implants, uh, either a uh, tissue expander or direct to implant or autologous um, uh, flap. Uh, can you comment also on uh, the timing of surgery for our patients? That, like, how do we decide on this? Do we ask the medical oncologist? And then how do we monitor patients as well? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, you know, I think that well, to start with, in the main, uh, I think more and more we have moved towards immediate reconstruction. You know, back 20, 30 years ago, all reconstruction was done in the delayed setting, in part because plastic surgeons had this notion that 
you know, people needed to get used to the idea of, of not having a breast and that they would then appreciate the reconstruction more, et cetera, et cetera. And we now know that that is not true. Um, and that you can really benefit patients uh, with immediate reconstruction where they can have their operation all in one setting and that the cosmetic results are very good and patients are very um, happy with the results. Now, the issue with timing really revolves around radiation more than anything else. Um, so, and that is because as I mentioned in the talk, it has to do with uh, the complications that radiation can impose. Now we know that not all mastectomy patients are gonna get radiation therapy. So in those patients who are not going to get radiation therapy, I think that you know, by and large, most patients will opt for immediate reconstruction. There may be other patient related factors that may make them want to have delayed reconstruction. So for example, clearly if you have a patient who has advanced disease, inflammatory breast cancer, et cetera, you're not even gonna think about doing immediate reconstruction. If you have patients for whom they have significant comorbidities, you don't wanna extend the uh, operative duration, et cetera, you may opt to delay reconstruction. But for those patients who are candidates for immediate reconstruction and are not going to be getting radiation therapy, Oftentimes that is going to be their choice. However, if patients are going to get radiation, this is where things get a little tricky. And that's why I showed all of that data. Um, you know, you could still do uh, uh, immediate reconstruction and simply radiate over your reconstruction, understanding that you are taking a risk of a higher complication rate. So whether that is a higher risk of, uh, you know, capsular contracture or uh, implant-based uh, complications, even if you did a direct to uh, implant reconstruction, or knowing that if you did an autologous reconstruction that you're going to get about a 20% uh, flap shrinkage you could still do the radiation knowing that and then planning accordingly and educating your patients accordingly. Some will opt, especially in the setting of, uh, 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 of uh, needing radiation to do kind of a delayed immediate where they'll put in a temporary tissue expander, expand up, give radiation to the tissue expander, then remove the tissue expander and then complete the uh, reconstruction, whether it's with a, an implant or whether it's with an autologous flap. And again, remember I showed you the data from that meta-analysis that demonstrated that there were risks associated to radiating the permanent implant. There were risks associated to uh, radiating the temporary tissue expander. So it's a matter of, of choice um, which complications are more important or less important to you and to the patient. And certainly, as with everything, you're, you're going to make these decisions in a multidisciplinary context. Uh, can I just bring up the point about breast reconstruction? In Malaysia now, the breast surgeons are trained to do their own reconstruction because when we depended on plastic surgeons, there was very little access to reconstruction. And only about 10% of patients, even now in the public sector, in Malaysia actually get immediate reconstruction or delayed reconstruction because um, it takes operating time. Um, for my side, I work in a private hospital, only 20% of the mastectomies get reconstructed. The most of the reason why they don't do it because they don't want the longer operation. But the other issue, I don't know whether you have it here, is that the insurance will not pay for breast reconstruction. It's considered cosmetic and insurance do not pay for breast reconstruction. What about in Philippines? Yeah. Okay, uh, usually here, here in the Philippines, they will uh, still, okay, a lot of uh, women will still choose mastectomy over uh, breast conserving surgery, primarily because of uh, financial uh, challenges here in the Philippines also, but uh, more and more because um, patients become uh, more educated and uh, they're like uh, this uh, type of um, conventions or symposiums, uh, they're presented with more options. And um, a, a lot of our patients, I was just uh, uh, talking to someone yesterday that uh, 
ever since like pandemic um, stabilized already, a lot of uh, patients already resort to having breast conserving surgery and they're not um, as scared to go to the hospital anymore uh, to have a radiation therapy, of course, that goes with uh, breast conserving surgery. So I, I would also would want to ask uh, to our Asian uh, counterpart in Malaysia, how do they perceive or how is the reception of, of um, uh, Asian patients in Malaysia, do they still go for a more radical approach or uh, a, the less conservative approach? And do you do a lot of uh, reconstruction and or oncoplastic surgery as well? Well, I think uh, nowadays women prefer a lumpectomy. In fact, if you want to do a mastectomy, they usually say no thank you. They will run off somewhere else because the most of the reason why women come late is actually they are scared of mastectomy. It's the body image problem. You know, um, even if we do a mastect, we say we can do reconstruction. Um, um, a lot of them are very scared of reconstruction as well. Even in the public sector, when you are offered practically free, they also do not want it. So I think a lot of times when it comes to, to surgery, it's a lot of patient counselling. It can take like half an hour or more just to counsel a patient on the types of surgery. I think um, options are there. We have uh, different options. And uh, you're right that um, most of our, of our plastic uh, or plastic surgery uh, procedures are not usually covered by uh, insurance as well. And uh, I think it's good also that uh, more and more breast surgeons in your area are also trained to do uh, oncoplastic surgery, which is also happening here in the Philippines. Uh, some of our breast, uh, of, of surgeons who specialize in breast um, cancer surgery also, went uh, for a training to do oncoplastic uh, surgery. So uh, I think all of our questions are hopefully uh, sufficiently addressed. And um, Dr. Chagpar uh, mentioned and uh, pointed out the need for a multidisciplinary approach for uh, every single patient. And uh, I'd like, uh, I, I love it when uh, she said, uh, repeatedly said, advantages and disadvantages of, of, of each technique. And I think the key to this, uh, uh, to choosing which is the best approach for a particular patient is really a good patient selection. And uh, Dr. Yip also mentioned um, de-escalation. I think all these options are on table uh, to all our breast cancer patients, but um, a, the role of a surgeon is not uh, just to do uh, each and every technique to all patients. I think um, having multidisciplinary approach and um, talking to our colleagues in plastic surgery and uh, with pathologists, more and more we understand the biology of a tumor and the significant biomarkers and we're able to uh, study the different molecular type and even the genomic and genetic profile of each uh, particular tumor. And I think mentioning all of these uh, factors is uh, clearly to us surgeons, we should um, personalize our approach. This is a case by case a basis uh, for all patients. And uh, with that, we give them a tailored and personalized treatment. So uh, with that, a uh, thank you to our two experts in uh, breast cancer surgery, Dr. Chagpar and uh, Dr. Yip. Uh, I think this uh, session has been very productive and I hope um, not just surgeons were listening, but patients were uh, made aware of all the options that can be done with them. Uh, the era of um, disfiguring and radical <laughs> surgery hope hopefully has ended already. And uh, we're into uh, less is more. And uh, this is because uh, of our uh, goal to, to lead to a better uh, cosmetic outcome and a better quality of life, not just both, uh, not just physically, but uh, the psychosocial well-being of our uh, breast cancer patients. But of course, we should be radical on oncologic safety. So that's when we cure our patients and when we make them cancer-free. So with that, uh, thank you very much for attending.